All right, we'll get started. Uh, thank you everyone for attending this morning's seminar in person and via Zoom. Uh, I'd like to start with the introduction of our speaker today, Dr. Anna Vivinero. Uh, Dr. Vivinero received a PhD in neuroscience from Universidad Nacional de Cordoba in Cordoba, Argentina, where she studied the role of oligodendrocytes in regulating extracellular glut glutamate. Uh, she then came to the U.S. to do a postdoc at Burke Neurological Institute in New York. Uh, she was initially mentored by John Cave and Caitlin Hill, who many of you guys know. Um, in their lab, she studied the mechanisms regulating cell adhesions in reactive astrocytes after spinal cord injury and discovered ZEP2 as a novel regulator of astrogliosis. Um, this was a high-profile study published in Cell Reports and led to a Craig Nielsen Foundation postdoctoral fellowship. She's currently an instructor at Burke, continu continuing her work in mechanisms of astrogliosis as an instructor in uh, Edmund Hollis's lab. Um, she is co-investigator on a New York State grant that supports this work. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Vivinero. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for that super nice introduction. So today I'm really excited to be sharing my work, trying to modulate and understand astrocytes and astrogliosis in the context of spinal cord injury. So first, um, I'm an instructor at Berg Neurological Institute. This is an institute in New York, in White Plains, that is associated with Well Cornell. And we try to understand and generate therapies for neurological diseases and injury. I work with, uh, as an instructor at um, Edmund Hollis Lab. The Hollis Lab tries to understand repair. And this can be CNS repair, DNS repair. Uh, many of the, of the lab members work with, um, with a circuit repair. And I'm the only one, uh, a little bit of a rebel that works with, with glial cells. So, uh, I try to understand repair after spinal cord injury. So injury triggers a repair process, although this process is not complete. It's also called a uh, wound healing process and involves different stages. We have an hemostatic stage to um, decrease the bleeding or stop the bleeding, then inflammatory stage that partially overlaps and a proliferative uh, stage. And these proliferative cells will uh, remodel and try to close the wound. So I said that this is uh, not a complete uh, wound healing process because in uh, extensive damage of the CNS, there will be a formation of a scar, a fibrotic scar that can be detrimental for axonal regeneration bad family. So the idea is that we want to uh, increase the repair, for, but to increase the repair, we need to understand it better. And for that, we have several advantages. One of the advantage is that this repair process not only occurs in spinal cord injury, but in many tissues. For example, probably everyone here has cut themselves uh, like the, the skin, like one time in their life. And in that case, our body triggers also a repair process, like the one that we are seeing on the screen. This is called epithelial uh, wound healing. In this case of the video, you can see that the repair process was complete. But in cases of extensive damage, there will be also a formation of fibrotic scar that never goes away. So if you can see these two pictures and you can compare this something that's very evident and is that the epithelial tissue, it's very accessible. So it has been better characterized. And therefore we can learn a lot about the, the modulators for this type of wound healing and then apply it to, um, to increase the wound healing on the CNS. So, my long-term goal is to generate therapies that are available for people with a spinal cord injury, but uh, many of you here, we start from an animal model of injury, and we're trying to work towards, towards a therapeutic intervention for humans, and that involves uh, different stages. The first stage is to understand the healing process, the cells involved, how these cells interact with each other, um, and then uh, understanding the molecular signature that these cells display after injury related to wound healing, 
and finally harnessing some elements from this molecular signature that are suitable for a pharmacological modulation. So today, as an overview, I'll talk about specifically the astrocyte role in wound healing, and I'll show evidence that astrocytes can be protective in the acute and subacute phase after injury, that they display a molecular signature that has uh, many points in common with the molecular signature that epithelial cells display after injury called epithelial 2 mesenchymal transition, or EMT. I'll talk specifically about one transcription factor of EMT, sub-2, and our studies in sub-2. And then I'll um, try to the end uh, of my work to present a little bit about our efforts to pharmacologically modulate EMT through rank rank ligand signal. So maybe the first question that you may have is why we are studying astrocytes at all. And it's because astrocytes are really important cells modulating wound healing. So this is a, a photomicrograph of an, an injured astrocyte. And then astrocytes after the injury, they uh, react to damage in a process called astrogliosis. This involves changes uh, at the cellular level and the physiological level of these cells. So the cells that are near or very near the lesion will uh, present the highest levels of astrogliosis, and they will form bundles of cells in a mesh-like structure. And this structure uh, that surrounds the lesion is called uh, astrocyte boundary uh, or astrocyte bound, uh, border. So here in this image, we can see this is a section, a horizontal section of the spinal cord, and we can see the lesion core. Uh, after spinal cord injury and the astrocyte border, uh, border structure. So this is a uh, result from Mina Banner at the Sofrono lab. And what she did also that I think is really interesting is to trace these bundles of astrocytes during time progression of a spinal cord injury. And what you can see is that this, uh, this astrocyte boundary, boundary structure it's really plastic and it closes during the time compressing the immune cells that are infiltrating. So for many years, and still it's a very, like a very big question on the field, is what is the role of the astrocyte boundary, right? So um, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but we know what we know from the astrocyte boundary comes from uh, at acute and at subacute phase, uh, comes from genetic modifications and ablation studies. So, for example, these are results uh, from also the Sofrona lab. And what they did here is to target uh, STAT3. STAT3 is a very important transcription factor that modulates astrogliosis after spinal cord injury. So, STAT3 knockouts display reduced levels of astrogliosis. And in this case, in the contour, you can see. Uh, the immune cells that and a very um, evident boundary with the astrocytes in green in the cell three knockout animals, these immune cells will spread towards healthy parts of the of the tissue. And that gives uh, or, or, yeah, gives like um, greater uh, lesion, lesion size, uh, more demyelination and less functional recovery. So for these studies, we know that inhibiting the boundary formation, also done it uh, with ablation of astrocytes, um, it's detrimental. Other studies did the opposite. They increase the STAT3 signaling. In this case, they use a SOX3 knockout. So SOX3 is an inhibitor of STAT3. So less SOX3 involves more STAT3 signaling. And you can see in this case, the colors are uh, opposite. So we have immune cells in uh, green and astrocytes in red. And we can see that the SOX3 knockout has um, a better wound healing process. The, the immune cells look more enclosed, the lesion looks smaller. And that also translates to a better functional recovery of these animals on the open field score. So we know then that astrocyte manipulation can enhance recovery. So what these and other studies show is that um, astrogliosis increases after spinal cord injury, reaching um, a point that in, in a mouse model is a subacute point, like seven days after injury, when there is a conformation of a boundary that is protective. So what we want to do here is actually accelerate the boundary formation 
but accelerate your increasing astroliosis, um, accelerate this bone deformation. So we will have smaller lesions that will likely resolve better in time, and we will lead to um, a better functional recovery. But for that, we need new targets that are responsible for the astrocyte modulation. We could use STAT3, of course, but the thing is that STAT3 is also a transcription factor that it's triggered in many cell populations, not only astrocytes. So we needed something that was a little bit more specific for astrocytes. So what we want to do here is to modulate the boundary. And uh, we are looking for targets that are responsible for the transition from a non-reactive astrocyte to a reactive astrocyte. And our strategy is looking at what we know from the molecular mediators of other types of wound healing, in this case, epithelial wound healing, which is uh, a very steady or characterized wound healing process. In epithelial wound healing, there is also an a transition. In this case, an epithelial cell transitions to a mesenchymal phenotype that will allow to remodel the wound. This process is called epithelial to mesenchymal transition. I'll talk today about it. It's called EMT. And the advantage of this is that there are many, um, many transcription factors, many, many different uh, molecular markers that we can study uh, in, um, in the context of astrogliosis. So what is EMT? EMT is a very important uh, biological process that involves an epithelial cell. What did I do? Okay. <laughs> so uh, it's not only present in, in healing, but also in cancer and development. It's a very important process and involves an epithelial cell transitioning to a mesenchymal phenotype. That means that the cell will acquire new characteristics. First, it uh, stops interacting with another neighboring cells and starts interacting with the extracellular matrix. It also starts expressing uh, proteins that allow to degrade extracellular matrix. Um, also starts to secrete in other extracellular matrix components like collagen. And this cell also will undergo a very important cytoskeleton reorganization. There will be expression of intermediate filaments, changes on acting cytoskeleton that will allow this cell to acquire a front rear polarity and, um, and migrate towards the injury. So at the molecular level, it involves a cell interacting with extracellular components through receptors, and these receptors will trigger a signaling cascade that will allow this cell to acquire a mesenchymal phenotype. So uh, these are the characteristics that I told you about. And we think that this is also important in the context of astrogliosis because uh, many of the characteristics of a cell under, uh, that's undergoing EMT are present in astrocytes. Not only that, but the uh, triggers for EMT, like hypoxia with extracellular matrix signaling, uh, are triggers for astrogliosis. The um, receptors for EMT, uh, like TGF-beta, TNF-alpha, uh, free cell, are receptors that are involved in astrogliosis. Uh, maybe a, a point that I want to stress out here is that um, uh, EMT is not an all or none process, but it will involve different molecular effectors uh, accordingly to uh, the cell and the, the external um, environment of the cell. So in some cells, we will involve some receptors and some molecular signaling. In other cells, we will involve other receptors and other subset of molecular signaling. So the question that we want to ask the system is, Taking all that we know from EMT, what from all this is important for astrogliosis? It's like uh, looking at this exploratory mar map that will allow us to identify uh, components that are important for astrogliosis. And this could be a very complicated question to ask the system. So we started from a very simple approach. We can look at canonical EMT markers. These are markers that are uh, frequently activated in different types of EMT. And we can also look at EMT transcription factors. These are uh, 
key modulators of the EMT process. So this is a little bit more about the specifics of EMT. Uh, these are the, the mesenchymal markers that I'm uh, trying to understand. I have projects trying to uh, see changes in these markers through different uh, times after uh, spinal cord injury. I specifically have a project that was uh, funded by the New York State uh, checking or under, trying to understand spark role in spinal cord injury. We see that it's increasing astrocytes after spinal cord injury. And we think that it can have a very important role in wound healing, but also in the development of fibrosis. So I'm really excited about the project that I'm starting. Today, I will talk uh, specifically about transcription factors. So these are canonical transcription factors from the EMT field. Um, they come in three families, the subfamily, snake family, and the twist family. And we wanted to know if these transcription factors were expressed or relevant for astrogeosis. So uh, our animal model is a spinal cord injury contusive spinal cord injury model. Probably many of you here are familiar with it. Uh, we use an infinite, infinite horizon C factor, which exposes spinal cord with a laminectomy, and we can hit the core with a specific force that we can modulate. In this case, uh, this experience Experiments uh, are done in thoracic uh, at the vertebral, vertebral level uh, nine. This is a moderate injury, and we use um, wild type animals. We analyze uh, gene expression and protein expression. This is um, regarding to uh, these are results regarding to snake and twist family. I, I brought a little bit about the twist, but the same happened with snake. We didn't see any expression of these transcription factors at any time point that we analyze after spinal cord injury or on an injured tissue. And this matched with uh, what we know from the exploration of RNA uh, sequencing in astrocytes. We don't see these factors being relevant in astrogliosis. But the things started to change when we look at the other family, the subfamily. So subfamily has two members, sub one and sub two. Both are increased after spinal cord injury, but they do it in different ways, in different, um, yeah, in different ways, I would say. So uh, for sub one, we see that increase after injury in the lesion core, and you can also see it uh, rosterly and cowardly from the lesion core. It's, it's like an overall increase of this transcription factor. And we wanted to know which cells were expressing this factor. So what we did was to do a co-immune staining for uh, sub-1 with different, um, different uh, markers for different cell types, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, neurons, microglia, endothelial cells. And we found that all of these um, populations would express sub-1 after injury. So it was so an overall response to injury. But um, as you can see, uh, astrocytes are expressing this factor. With SEP2, we uh, also saw that uh, there was an increase on SEP2 expression after injury. In this case, it wasn't present on the lesion core, but uh, surrounding the lesion core, this pyrilesional area, uh, rosterly and caudally from the lesion. So in, in this case, we also analyze the cells that were expressed in sub-2, and we see it um, mostly restricted to astrocytes. There were some oligodendrocytes that would express sub-2 on the perilesional area, but mostly astrocytes. And we also find it not only on the nuclear fractions, but on the cytoplasmic fractions of these cells. We analyze the progression of the expression of sub-2, it increases uh, early on time, like three days after injury, peaks at seven days. So when this boundary is consolidating and then decreases but stays elevating until the late remodeling phase. So our last time point was 30 days post injury. And since sub 2 was more restricted to astrocytes, we then asked the system, what's the role of this protein uh, after spinal cord injury? So what we did, was to generate a conditional knockout for SEP2 uh, with uh, using a GFIP driver and a tamoxifen-dependent uh, cream. 
We injected tamoxifen uh, seven days for seven days surrounding the time of injury to target these highly prolif proliferative cells surrounding the lesion. And we did motor behavior and uh, histological analysis. So for motor behavior, we chose to use the catwalk system. This allowed us to run an animal on a transparent catwalk and analyze the prints of the animal and the walking pattern of the animal and gives us uh, a lot of information about the gait, um, the recovery of the gait. So there are many variables that we can study there. Uh, I just brought two, but there are many. Uh, one that I really like that is uh, very related to spinal cord injury is the regularity index of the step sequence. So how regular the stepping pattern of this animal is. So what we can see here in these two points is uh, the pre-injury values, uh, animals are 100% regular on the step pattern, and then they drop after injury. And whereas the control animals recover the step pattern uh, within two weeks, the knockout animals, they show a delayed recovery. Other parameter that I, I like is the base of support of the forelimbs. I told you that this is um, a thoracic injury, but we see that the forelimbs are also affected. And they try to uh, compensate from, uh, for, for the lack of, of stability of the gas animals. So what we can see here is the basis of support, so how far apart the two forelimbs are. After injury, animals tend to increase the base of support uh, to compensate for the lack of stability. And whereas uh, control animals, they gradually decrease the base of support to an injured levels, uh, except to knockout animals, they still need a bigger base of support. This tells us that uh, SEP2 is modulating um, recovery, motor recovery after spinal cord injury. And we wanted to analyze a little bit about uh, what's the histological correlate for, for this. So what we did was to trace uh, trace lesions. Uh, we uh, trace lesions in serial sections, um, like the ones here. We use like ten to twelve serial sections per animal, and we um, we generated three D lesions uh, using Neurolucida to analyze the volume. And what we found is that sub two animals show a bigger lesion compared to control animals. Control animals are animals that have the Cree, but they don't have the flux gene. So all of the animals were injected with amoxifen. Um, since uh, the lesion uh, site is also quickly correlated with uh, astrogliosis, we analyzed the astrogliosis levels using GFAD uh, as a marker. And we found that sub-2 knockout animals, they show reduced levels of astrogliosis in immunohistochemistry, in Western blood. We also uh, manually traced astrocytes on reactive and non-reactive places. Um, and we see that there is a morphological difference between um, sub-2 knockout animals and control animals um, in the astrocytes on, only on the reactive places, but not on the non-reactive. So. Oh no. <laughs> so, um, sub two knockout animals display thinner processes that correlates with a less reactive phenotype. So, since sub two looks like it's very important for astrogliosis, we wanted to analyze how this transcription factor was modulated. And there are many ways that we can modulate uh, this transcription factor. Uh, one that we thought it was really interesting is this um, long known coding RNA uh, called sep 2 os OS comes from the opposite strand of sep 2 because it's transcribed from the opposite strand. And then what it does is partially binds to sep 2 sequence and prevents the splicing of an internal ribosomal entry site. What, uh, what it does is driving the expression of SEP2 into a protein. So it's like an enhancer of SEP2. We found that uh, we did RNA scope and we found that after injury, uh, in injury levels, the, the in non injury levels, uh, SEP2 OS is not present there. Uh, but after injury, we see an increased expression of this long known coding RNA um, where, where this boundary uh, of astrocyte is. And something that is 
I think it's really interesting is that step two us could be a way of communication between transcription factors that we know, like step three and step two, because we see that step two OS levels decrease in step three knockouts, but not step two levels. So what we think is happening here is that our hypothesis that step three levels uh, modulate step two OS levels, and then this long non-coding RNA modulates the translation of SEP2 protein. So it's like um, a bridge of communication and expression between these two factors. So after we published this, there was a paper um, trying to understand also long non-coding RNAs in the context of astroliosis and spinal injury. And they also found that sep 2 is really important after injury. So it was really good to see that um, this work continued because I think it's, it's really interesting, the long going RNA part, long non going RNA part. So that's the summary of the part one. I just wanted to remember that astrocytes are very important for the wound healing process. Then they will express a subset of uh, transcription factors that are related to EMT, like SEP1 and SEP2. We do experiments with the uh, SEP1, uh, SEP2, sorry, because it's SEP1, there's no, at the moment, there was no uh, conditional knockout for SEP1. Um, and what we find is that if we target SEP2, we have a worse outcome. So we have uh, larger lesions, less astroiliosis, and less functional recovery in this animal. And then there is, we identify this long non-coding RNA that can be a bridge of communication between um, known transcription factors like STAT3 and SEP2. So maybe the question here is, okay, so what? Uh, what's the significance of all this? So I think the significance comes like in many flavors. One is that these um, elements, regulatory elements, uh, we, we found evidence that they are concerned between CNS injury. So we, we collaborated with a group that does a stroke in, in BNI. Uh, this is uh, Sanjicho lab and um, the postdoc there, Ildukim, he did uh, these experiments in uh, the stroke model. So he took the sub 2 knockout animals and found that also regulates astroiliosis and functional recovery after stroke. So we think that this is not restricted only for spinal cord injury, but it can have like an overall role in CNS injury. Also, that these could be concerned mechanisms um, between species. So we did experiments in mice, uh, but uh, the group of Dr. Maisa Mokala at Washington University uh, analyzes zebrafish. And uh, her group is uh, trying to analyze uh, um, a bridging glia after a zebrafish transaction injury that bridges the two parts of the transactive spinal cord. So what her group does is uh, transcriptomics of these cells. And they found that these cells would express many of uh, these EMT transcription factors after injury, including sub 2 So they, they actually think that uh, in the title, they said that these uh, describe this as an EMT-like response. Other thing that I think is interesting is that she uh, then tried to do, uh, like, analyze um, the transcriptional activity of these cells with respect to uh, the transcriptional activity of, um, of glial cells in mice. So they analyzed uh, what was the correlate with um, Schwann cells because they form bridges after spinal cord injury. Uh, they didn't find many correlate on this transcriptional activity, but they found correlates with uh, astrocytes after injury. So here we can see transcripts that are overactivated or increase on reach uh, after spinal cord injury in both mouse, um, mouse astrocytes after injury and zebrafish, and in red uh, transcripts that are downregulated in both. So there is a lot of overlap between these cells. So if this is relevant for fish and this is relevant for mouse, maybe it's also relevant for humans. Other thing uh, that I think is interesting comes with this idea of that maybe mouse um, 
mouse exercises can make bridges too. It's just that it's like very unexplored. Uh, so these are results uh, using a strategy to increase axonal regeneration with that P10 knockout. We can see we, we can see that uh, the the axons that go to the other side of the spinal cord are using um, these these exercises here in blue to bridge. Uh, and to cross to the other side. So maybe if we modulate uh, this EMT response, we are not only increasing uh, the wound healing response, but also favoring the formation of these uh, bridging uh, astrocytes um, that could be very beneficial for the combinatorial uh, therapies. So uh, maybe now, uh, the question is, what is the next step? So what are we doing? We are analyzing um, EMT response, not only acutely, but subacutely and chronically. And we are doing this by targeting sub 2 doing transcriptomics, and doing uh, also we are doing the pharmacological targeting of EMT. So the role, we, we are very interested, or I'm really interested in understanding the role of EMT uh, in subacute or chronic. So there is, uh, I was reading a little bit of the wound healing literature, and there is a hypothesis uh, that says that injury can generate a physiological wound healing response. And this is because there is a transient EMT activation that um, generates a heal wound, but also it can generate a pathological wound healing response. This is because there is a sustaining activation that never goes away. And this is because there is an inflammatory stimuli that's always triggering the surrounding cells to express an EMT response. And that leads to a formation of a fibrotic scar, a fibrotic wound. And we think that this may be also relevant in our model because we see that um, after injury, uh, the levels of uh, transcription factors related to EMT like SAP2 peak, but then they, uh, until the last time point that we have, they never completely go away. And this not only happens with the, uh, with SAP2, but with other factors that we are establishing like Spark. So we really don't know what's the role of SAP2 later in the progression of spinal cord. Uh, maybe it's um, modulating or, or increasing scarring at the later. So maybe it's like a bimodal response. So what we are doing now is analyzing the role of sub 2 in subacute by using the same genetic tool as we have, but injecting tamoxifen later after spinal cord injury. So the other thing that we are interesting is, I feel like we we have like a, uh, like an iceberg, right? So we, we started with the tip of an iceberg with sub 2, uh, but we don't know what is like, um, below the iceberg. So what we are trying to understand a little bit about um, the whole EMT uh, signaling or related signaling, we uh, I started explore, uh, doing an exploration of RNA-seq uh, from publicly available sources. This is from the Sofrona lab. This is uh, 14 days after an injury. Uh, and we find that there are many EMT factors increased in astrocytes specifically. Uh, after injury, but we don't know what's happening before or after. So we want to expand our knowledge about this. Uh, specifically, uh, we want to analyze what is happening after, like 30 days, one month, six, mo six months after the injury. Does the, the CMT uh, response goes away or not? Uh, so what we are doing now is um, purifying RNA uh, using a technical trap, so translating ribosome affinity purification. And uh, we are getting the, the last samples, and uh, we will send these to, to sequence um, the RNA from astrocytes after injury. So this is very excited, exciting uh, new uh, ways. So uh, last if this is an EMT signaling, we can actually modulate it. And the good thing is that there are many of the advantages, there are many um, 
tools that I have been developed in other fields, like the cancer field, the development field, the wound healing field, that we can now bring to the spinal cord injury field to model like this, uh, these uh, factors. So first, maybe the, the question is like, we were trying to do a proof of concept that we can actually target astrogliosis uh, after injury by using EMT pharmacological modulation. So um, maybe if the first uh, thing that I told you is true, we may need to increase uh, EMT early on time in, in the time point to increase or, or to uh, make the, the, the lesion smaller to increase the wound healing. But maybe at later time points, we will need to decrease EMT to decrease astrogliosis and make the environment more permissive for axons. So what we were trying to do is finding a receptor ligand pathway that allows us to do both, like increase or decrease EMT as a proof of concept. And I was looking uh, at the literature and found this pathway that is described mostly for bone remodeling. It's called rank ligand pathway. Involves a ligand uh, called rank ligand that binds to a receptor and triggers EMT, including SAP2. So what we can do here is uh, treat um, and, and increase the viability of the ligand, or we can use an antibody to prevent the ligand binding to a receptor. So these are more of the specifics. What uh, rank ligand does is increase um, signaling involved with NF-kappa beta, ARC, c CFOS. Uh, it's very similar to what TNF uh, alpha receptor binding does. Uh, NF kappa beta is a known activator of SAP1 and SAP2, for example. We know also that rank ligand and rank are important uh, molecules in astroglioma. So this is uh, one of the first experiments that we did, and it was to treat the animals acutely after spinal cord injury. In this case, we use a severe spinal cord injury. We, we were also interested in see what happens very uh, chronically after injury. That's why we use a severe um, model. And then we treated these animals intrathecally for three days. So this is an acute intervention with rung ligand or a protein that has a similar molecular weight like a GFP. And we did uh, also um, a like a histological characterization and a functional characterization of these animals. So we also did a cow uh, system. Um, and one of the other things that we added now that in, at the Hollis lab is doing pursuing a marketless post estimation with deep lab cuts. So we can record the animals and then we can run them uh, on this program that allow us to track different parts of the animals uh, without the necessity of a marker, uh, like a, a physical marker of these animals. And this is a good way to uh, add things to the catwalk uh, because there are many parameters that we can uh, get that are not uh, specific for catwalk, like the tail height or the body height. We can see, sorry, uh, what we can see here is that actually uh, these are males uh, after injury. And you can see that the rank lion animals, they uh, show a worse recovery or not a complete recovery compared to control animals. And this was very, surprising for us because we would think uh, our hypothesis is that if we treat this animal with wrong lion, we would increase EMT, increase uh, the, um, the wound healing uh, mechanisms, and then we'll uh, increase the functional recovery. And we found the opposite. So what we wanted to do is um, then to analyze the histological correlate of this. So we use, um, also um, a lesion reconstructor, uh, reconstruction, we found that rank ligand animals show an increase, uh, overall increased lesions, uh, that they show reduced astrogliosis. And also we analyze uh, proliferation of these cells, uh, injecting EDU, and we found that rank ligand animals show a decreased proliferation. 
So this um, correlates with what we see at the motor side. Uh, it was really surprising because we would expect the, the opposite. So we are adding a couple of things. One is analyzing other layer of complexities, analyzing the cell morphology. Um, this is an important, cell morphology and polarity are important hallmarks for EMT. That's why we wanted to uh, add this uh, strategy. We are using um, transgenic animals that allow us to label microglia, macrophages, which could be also targeted by, by rank ligand, and uh, astrocytes. Uh, we can sparsely label astrocytes, so this is a uh, stack. Uh, you can see the astrocytes here in magenta. We can clear these spinal cords and reconstruct them, um, and reconstruct the 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 cell morphology and analyzing things like polarity of the cells, and not only polarity, but also interactions between cells, which I think is a very interesting uh, tool, not only for this project, but uh, for many of the projects that I have in the future. So one of the things, this is also preliminary, but uh, one of the things that we are analyzing is the volume of the cells. And we found that uh, rank lion treated animals show a decrease, an overall decrease uh, volume of, astro uh, of astrocytes. So this matches with a reduced astrogliosis on these cells. And with these animals, also we can do things in vivo and analyzing uh, the dynamics of these cells. Uh, EMT is a very dynamic process. So what I'm doing now, and these are results from last week, is um, I'm implanting spinal chambers on animals. And this allows us to do two photon microscopy on a live animal. So uh, the video I'll show, this is um, uh, stuck uh, at low magnification where we can see uh, green microglia, macrophages, and the astrocytes. So I think this will allow us to a better understanding of the dynamics of these cells. Uh, and I'm very excited about that. So as a summary of part two, um, we, we want to understand the role during uh, SCI uh, progression. So not only acute, but also subacute and chronically after injury. So we are first genetically target uh, EMT and SEP2 on later uh, stages after spinal cord injury. We're having, we're doing an unbiased EMT activation at, uh, using trans, uh, exploration using transcriptomics. And then we are pharmacologically targeting this uh, process with rank rank and pathway. So we, See, uh, our preliminary results show that actually targeting acutely generates a worse outcome. And so what also these uh, results show is that astrogliosis can be manipulated by a non-invasive way. So I think this is one of the important take home messages. Uh, and we know from this and other studies that we are doing, that timing is crucial. So we can have uh, a molecular target that we want to do, we want to study and modulate, and the result the outcome will be completely different between, and if we treat the animals or we, we yeah, we treat the animals as acute, subacute, or chronically after spinal cord injury. And maybe the, the, the strategy now that I'm thinking is that maybe we shouldn't try to push something earlier on time, but respecting the biological timing of this process and enhancing in that biological timing. So we are now switching off a treatment and the subacute phase where this boundary is consolidated to see uh, if we can get an enhanced wound healing. So with that, uh, I want to acknowledge everyone uh, that uh, was key on, on these uh, different stages of the project. Um, I'm working uh, with Dr. Hollis and we have been um, 
doing like developing this uh, rank ligand, the transcriptomic, and uh, also projects that I have with uh, astrocyte uh, polarity that I didn't have the chance to talk, the Spark project. And of course, I want to uh, name Dr. John Kay or Dr. Hill that they helped me a lot with the first part of the project, the, the sub project uh, to start uh, my journey with, with astrocytes. I want to thank everyone at the Hollis Lab, former members, our collaborators, our funding, and everyone here and online to uh, pay attention. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Hello. Thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you, really. Um, Thank so you. I have a lot of questions. This bring, brings me back to my astrocyte and spinal cord injury <laughs> time. So um, first of all, in the first part of your talk where you talked about the ZEP2 conditional knockout, did you look at what genes are actually modulated downstream of ZEP2 in, in the astrocytes? Mm. That would be interesting to understand. Yes. So. Uh... We were, we were, so the question is like, what, what's the target for SEP2 or SEP1 also? Um, we, um, there are many targets that we know from the cancer field. Uh, one is that uh, it's inhibiting uh, cathirins. So it's switching cathirins uh, in canonical EMT, switching cathirins from E cathirins, so epithelial cathirins to N cathirins. We know that he cathirins are not present in astrocytes, but N cathirins are present in astrocytes. We haven't done an exploration of what exactly happens after spinal cord injury. So uh, the idea that we had in mind was to combine the transcriptomics with the L10 on the trap with the knockouts and see that that would be great. Yeah, yeah. Or you can just sort your astrocytes from your knockout and just do transcriptomics straight on that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the other question is in your Rankel experiments. Uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but it seems to me that you may be activating rank in many other cells, microglia, myelin cells, yes. that are probably causing a lot of inflammation dependent on rank. It's very much like TNF, like you said. So that's probably one of the reasons why you're not seeing. It would be interesting to do the same experiment in microglial specific or myelin specific conditional knockout for rank L, and though you, you'll explore what's happening in the astrocytes. Yeah, definitely. I think that the project is just a starting project. Yeah. Uh, the idea was more like a proof of concept. Can we modulate the astrogeosis? But then it's like growing and growing. Um, one of the ways to analyze um, microgliosis and like uh, this microglia and macrophages responses to do, uh, to analyze uh, how these cells behave. Uh, that's why we are, uh, we have the CX3CR1 knock, uh, Six three zero one GFP animal, so a reporter animal for microglia macrophages, and analyzing. Um, we are doing like two photon. We are doing clearing uh, to analyze how these cells behave. Uh, but yeah, definitely that is a part of the project that is super important. Uh, these cells they they migrate. They are super motile. They are. It's it's like spinal cord injury is not just one cell doing something. It's like the combination of these uh, different cells that, that interact with each other in super complex ways. So of course, if we target something, we'll change the complete uh, landscape. So it's very important to have like an overall view of what is happening. Yes. Thank you, that's great. Zoom listeners, do we have any other questions? Any questions? Oh, we have one here, one second. Hi, thank you for your talk. Really thank interesting. Um, in spinal cord injury, we know that there's like very dynamic phases of inflammatory responses. And you mentioned how you think that decreasing or increasing sub 2 would have different effects. What do you expect in a chronic phase when you have a secondary inflammatory response? Do you think um, increasing sub 2 would lead to more of a fibrotic wound due to that sustained um, EMT 
response or what do you think? Yeah, exactly. So the question is like what what a little bit about like what's the role of top two in these like uh, very uh, late time points. Um, I think this is just my hypothesis on how I see things. I think this is by model. So you, it's like in a, in the wound healing field, it's also a by model response. So you need wound healing. Uh, you need EMT uh, to close the wound, but then it's uh, it's a, a mechanism that also generates some trouble, right? So if the lesion is big, if you have a lot of pro-inflammatory pro components that they never resolve, that will be always uh, targeting the cells that are perilesional to express uh, EMT. And we think that this is driving fibrosis uh, because, uh, for example, we are interested on SPARC. Uh, SPARC is a protein that can be secreted on the extracellular matrix and bites, binds collagen. So these cells will uh, secrete SPARC and this binds and stabilizes collagen, so it increases fibrosis. So this is a way that could be uh, this EMT um, later, uh, later EMT could be increasing fibrosis, not the only one. Also a cell that undergoes EMT uh, secretes extracellular matrix components that could be also accounting for fibrosis at later stages. So it's something that, it's really important to know like exactly what's the role on, on chronic and I'm really looking forward to it. Yes, thank you. Dr. Dalton has a question. Um, yes. Hi, uh, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, intriguing data. You did uh, touch briefly on that one image about what was happening with the, the microglia in terms of your manipulations with the astrocytes. So. I kind of think about these two cell groups interacting quite a lot. So what, when, with your various manipulations, what, what did you see about the phenotype of the astrocyte uh, of the microglia to change in any way? Thank you. Yeah, so we, we still be, thank you for the question. So we, we are still in the very early phases of understanding uh, astrocyte and microglia interactions. Uh, one of the easiest way to do it now is just to analyze how many we can label astrocytes very sparsely and then um, count how many uh, microglia are actually physically interacting with astrocytes. We have, uh, I've done a clearing and now I'm like looking at astrocytes all the time and I can see that after injury there is a very close connection with astrocytes with microglia. We, we exactly don't know what that means it can mean a lot of things. So this is one of the things that I'm I'm really really interested on doing. Yes, definitely because we know from from people in the field that um, microglia can trigger uh, like a kind of a pro-inflammatory state of astrocytes too. So they can drive astrocytes to be uh, more like a repair phenotype or more uh, detrimental. So it's really interesting and. Uh, this is one of the the future projects. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. So, Anne, I was going to ask you in the, in the, toward the beginning of your talk um, that the ZEP2 phenotype seems to be very related to the STAT3 knockout phenotype. Yeah. Right. And so my initial question was going to be, you know, are there, are these synergistic or parallel pathways? But then it seems like with the STAT3 knockout, there's a decreased expression of set 2 os So do you think that these are in fact you know, synergistic, like same pathways or what, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, so yes, that is one of the areas that uh, sep 2 os is like bridging this communication. We exactly don't know if it's just one way or both. Uh, we know that sep 2 os decreases after injury. Um, sorry, that um, levels of, of sep 2 os decrease in stat knockout animals. Uh, and this is a way that uh, the protein of sep 2 could be modulated. 
Um, but also there's work, uh, the work that I presented, well, I, I didn't present it, but I, I mentioned about sub 2 os uh, that was also published in Salt Reports. What they do is they culture astrocytes and they have a sub 2 os knockout. Uh, in astrocytes, and they found that uh, knocking out SAP2 OS affects the levels of STAT3. So I think it's like the two ways around, right? We don't know exactly if they are at the same level or not. Uh, I have the feeling. Uh, I, I, my hypothesis is that STAT3 uh, is a little bit above uh, SAP2, uh, and it's like this communication, but it can go the other way too. Yes. So, so they're regulating each other. They're not yes. independent parallel pathways. No, okay. definitely they're no, not independent. Okay. Yes. From, from what we know as an evidence. Okay. Yes. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you.